not, then um, we're going to look at section 4.4, which is about cavity. What? Don't make us go back two years. Oh, dear. <laughs> Not that far. 11 was a good year, actually. Um, concavity, inflection points. about what it means for function to be increasing or decreasing on an interval, right? That would have been on Monday. So what I want to do, now we're going to bring the concavity into the discussion. Let me show you a couple of graphs. say in this case that graph of n is concave up. Is f increasing or decreasing? Increasing or decreasing on the entire bill line? Both. But it's both, right? It's decreasing on the interval from minus infinity to whatever this number is, and then it's increasing from this number to infinity. So let's just sort of get that out, out on the table. Concavity. And whether a function is increasing or decreasing, those are completely separate, unrelated issues. For some reason, um, I've noticed in the past that, that students try to connect the two. They try to sort of force this relationship between, you know, a concave up and increasing, concave down and decreasing. There is no such relationship. It doesn't make sense. So I just wanted to, to mention that, and I'll probably mention it again. Decreasing on the on the real line. Both. 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 You have to right. It's increasing on the interval from minus infinity to whatever this is, and decreasing from here to here. So again, increasing, decreasing, concave up, concave down, are completely separate issues. Okay. Now, 
this is great. It's very intuitive. You look at the, the graph that's concave up, and you see that it's. I mean, it's in, in some of our, our college algebra teachers say that um, it's concave up if it holds water, and it's concave down if it spills water. I know. I'm just repeating what they say. Uh, uh, probably a better description, something that's, that doesn't involve liquids, is uh, like cup up and cup down. I've heard that before. That's okay, but the hold and spill is one. So here's what I want you to notice. Because what I'm going to do is give you an actual formal definition of uh, what it means to be concave up and concave down. If you look at the slopes of the tangent lines going from left to right, and I realize it's kind of difficult to see if you blow it up, but then no. <laughs> The tangent line at this point, is it positive or uh, is the slope of the tangent line at this point? Negative. It's negative. Now go to the next point. Still negative. It's still going to be negative. It's still going to be negative. But which of the two slopes, slope of this or the slope of this, is greater? Numerically. Because as it goes this way, it's approaching zero. Need a higher grade of slope now. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's do this. This will make it easier. Um, I want you to just estimate. Give me a a, a very rough estimate. What might the slope of, let's just assign a number for that. What, what could the slope possibly be? It has to be negative. So give it a number. What? Negative three. Okay, now, what about this one? Negative three halves. Negative three halves. So the, okay, and then what about this one? Zero. Zero. So here's the point. As you go from left to right, the slopes are increasing. Do you see that? If you're going from minus 3 to minus 3 halves to 0 to maybe this is 3 halves and maybe this is 3. You're going, what, what's happening is those, uh, as you go from left to right, those slopes are increasing. And what about over here? Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying the function is decreasing. I'm looking <coughs> strictly at the slopes. And I'm comparing consecutive uh, slopes at consecutive points. So this might be 3. And this is still positive, but it's, the slope is more gradual. So it could be like 3 halves, 1 and a half, 0 minus one and a half, minus three, down here minus six, up, and so forth and so on. Oops, you can't see that. I need, every time I zoom in, that happens. Okay, so this first definition is a sort of definition of what it means for a, a function to be concave up or concave down on an interval. graph of f, or we say that f is concave, um, I better see this one, guys. Too far. Concave. 
give up. In the second case, concave down. <clears throat> Let me try it. Uh, let's just define it on open and a little bit safer. Uh, we say that the graph of uh, F is concave up or concave down on the open interval I. If the <coughs> first derivative is now remember the first derivative gives you the slope, the tangent line. And so when it was concave up. What was happening to the slopes of the tangent lines as we went from left to right? They were increasing. So uh, on the open interval I, if f prime is increasing, what about concave down? What's happening to the slopes there? Decreasing. Yeah, they're getting numerically smaller, decreasing. There are other ways to, to define the concavity. Um, one way is to, if you draw the, the tangent line and the tangent line lies below the curve, do you understand what I'm saying? Of course it touches the curve at the, at the uh, point of tangency. But if the tangent line is always lying below the curve, then, um, and notice that when it's concave up, that's exactly the case. Do you see that when I draw the tangent lines here? Can you see that they do touch the curve at the point of tangency, but then everywhere else nearby, the line is below the curve. Yeah. And we only deal with concavity with uh, second degree polynomials, because once you go to like third or fourth, you've got more than one. Curve. Well, we, we're going to use concavity, <coughs> we're going to discuss concavity for lots of different functions, not even necessarily polynomials. So it applies really to anything, any function um, second derivative can be taken. And that's the other thing, that's the second derivative is coming into play in a minute. But I want you to read this statement. <coughs> Does it match sort of what you're seeing up here? are increasing, slopes are decreasing, you see that? So this is our definition. Then comes the, the most important theorem. <clears throat> I think even more important than the second, well, maybe not, maybe they're neck and neck. Okay, um, <coughs> let's just say it this way. If F double prime prime is either positive or negative on some interval. Say it's open. Okay, this is maybe a little bit tricky. I'm not sure. Let's see. Here's what you need to know. F double prime is the derivative of F prime, right? So if you take the derivative of F prime, 
<coughs> i.e. f double prime. You take the derivative of a function, and the derivative of that function is positive. Then what's the function doing? <coughs> what? Increasing, right? I mean, if you want to, you can, uh, I don't know, replace this f prime, because f prime is, is a function of its own right. Replace f prime by g. If g prime is positive, then g is increasing. Remember that? Uh, if g prime is negative, then g is decreasing. But what we have here is not some random function g. It's actually f prime. But the same thing applies. If f prime, if its derivative is positive, then that means that f prime is increasing. And if the derivative of f prime is negative, then that means that f prime decreasing. So when the derivative is positive, the function is increasing. When the derivative is negative, the function is decreasing. But in this case, the function happens to be f prime. If f prime is increasing, then f is what? Concave. Yeah. If, if, if f prime is increasing, concave up. And if f prime is decreasing, f is concave down. Okay, now what you really need to get out of this is not so much this middle part, that's just the transition part that sort of explains how you get from here to here. This part is really not, once, once you've discussed the theorem, this really isn't important. What's important is that if f double prime is positive, then f is concave up. And if f double prime is negative, then f is concave down. And this middle part was just sort of the stepping stone from this statement to this statement. So let's do some uh, examples. Showing the open intervals on which this function is concave <coughs> up. 
So when you're looking to determine where the function is increasing or decreasing, you use the first derivative. If you're looking to see where the function is concave up or concave down, you use the second derivative. So we're going to use the second derivative here. So I'm going to go right past the first derivative. I'm going to take it and then just move on. What's the derivative of this? For x cubed two plus twelve x squared minus ten. Now we want to know where is this function concave up, where is it concave down? Uh, let's do this as well. That's true, isn't it? Okay, so I want to know, I want to know where the second derivative is positive, where the second derivative is negative. If I want to know where it's positive and where it's negative, I probably first want to determine where it's zero. of these three intervals is the sign of the second derivative. I don't care what the actual number is. I just want to know, is it positive or is it negative? So starting to the left of negative 2, you can go back to either the, well, I go back to the factor of 1. <coughs> if you pick negative 3 or negative a million, whatever, as long as it's to the left of negative 2. This is going to be negative, right? This is going to be negative. You multiply two negative numbers together, you get a positive number. So if that double prime is positive on the interval from minus infinity to minus 2. What about in between negative 2 and 0? So what if you pick negative 1? Well, Pick negative one, this factor is going to be negative. And this one's going to be positive. Positive number times a negative number is negative. Then you go to the right of zero, pick whatever, one, a million, it doesn't matter. This is going to be positive, as is this. And the product of two positive numbers is. Then, of course, we want to, to indicate what this uh, sign chart tells us about the behavior of the original function. And what it tells us is that on the interval from minus infinity to minus 2, the graph is what? Increasing. 
Is it increasing? This is the second derivative. Uh, decreasing. It's not increasing, not decreasing. What are we talking? What have we been talking about? It's concave upward. Concave up. Oh. Does concave up mean increasing? No. Uh, between <coughs> negative two and zero, the second derivative is negative, so the graph is what? Concave down. Concave down. And then from zero to infinity, concave up. So let me just wrap this up here. Concave up on minus infinity to minus 2. And then again from 0 to infinity. And concave down on the open interval. OK, so. Look, concave up, don't make, don't create this relationship between concepts that doesn't exist. The concavity and the increasing, de decreasing nature are completely different concepts. If you look at, um, look at the, just to sort of drag this point home. Increasing or decreasing? Yeah, it's increasing, right? It's rising as you look from left to right. <coughs> so here we have two functions, both of which are increasing. The first one is concave up, and the second is concave down. <coughs> So if you know that a, a graph is concave up on a certain interval, it, it may be increasing on that interval. It may be decreasing on that interval. It may be increasing on part and decreasing on another part. The point is, is that there is no correlation between uh, concavity and increasing and decreasing. They're completely separate. So if in your mind somehow you're trying to connect, like concave up with increasing, then um, maybe if you've got a, enough of a, a, a shock to the, to the brain, maybe that would just snap that, you know, really not good idea, right? But whatever it takes to, if, if, you're, if you find yourselves still trying to connect with those two, um, well, stop it. And what may happen is you may work some problems and, and sort of make that mistake and get confused. And, and at that point, then you need to ask me or somebody else and get that clarified. Um, so that come test time, which is coming, coming up very soon, you'll be clear on the fact that, hey, these are two entirely separate issues. OK. Um, Oh yeah. Uh, this time we're going to define the uh, point of inflection.
two things have to, to be true in order for Frank Su to actually be a point of inflection. Uh, the most important thing, of course, is that the concavity changes. The second thing that needs to happen at a point of inflection is um, graph has to be smooth. You can have concavity changes. You can go from like concave down to concave up. Um, and the change can occur at points where the graph is, is not smooth. And we don't call those points of inflection. We want the graph to be smooth, a smooth transition from concave up to concave down or vice versa, if, we're, if we are to actually call that point a point of inflection. It's got to be smooth. OK. Um, by the way, let's go back to the last. Um, Example. Now, since f is a polynomial function in this last example, all all of the it's a smooth function, and all of its derivatives are smooth. Everything's different; you can differentiate until you get zero. Um, so, smoothness is not an issue. Having said that. Notice that there's a, a change in concavity. This will concave up and concave down at x equals negative 2. Do you see that? And then there's a change in concavity at 0. So the points do the concavity changes. Negative 2 comma f of negative 2, sorry, this should be negative. I'm not even going to calculate it. And 0, f of 0. then one of two things has to be true. <coughs> Either Well, look at these inflection points. Let's go back to this, this problem. At the inflection point, looking more specifically at the, the x-coordinate of the inflection point. So at the x-coordinate of the inflection point, what was the second derivative equal to? Zero. Zero, in both cases. So if, you're in, if you are at an inflection point, then when we take the second derivative of at your x-coordinate, we either get zero, or here's another possibility, Take a guess. 
So these are, um, I, I sometimes call them secondary critical points, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, what this theorem tells me is that if I'm searching for inflection points, then I start my search by taking the second derivative, <coughs> determining where it's zero, determining where it's undefined. That's not enough to actually say for sure that there's, because I mean, if you look at this sign term, it alternated, right? Concave up, concave down, concave up. Is it always given? No. So just because you have, uh, let's say you determine that the second derivative is zero at five and seven, that doesn't mean that those two things are going to produce inflection points. There might, for one or both of them, I suppose, there might not be a sign change in the second derivative, which means there might not be a change in concavity. So when you set the second derivative equal to zero, what you're getting are candidates for inflection points. You really have to go further and test to the left and the right to see if, it's actually a, if there's actually a change in concavity. Same thing for this uh, second condition. If f double prime of c is undefined, Maybe it is an inflection point. Let's see if the, the concavity changes. But also, the smoothness has to be assessed as well. And we'll do that in the next example. And the next example is actually, uh, well, the, the function that we're going to be using is the function that we used, I think it was in the last example on Monday. I hope. Tell me if this looks familiar. So, what is the derivative? And don't give me the don't give me the simplified version. Give me the unsimplified version. Two, two thirds x, the negative one third times k minus x plus x to the two thirds. Minus. No, oh, minus x to the two thirds. Wait, I don't I think, I don't remember using the product you guys you all distributed the x first yeah and then you took the, we took the derivative and then what what did we get i mean you can do it either way but i, I just want to know thank you to the negative one third The reason why I want it in that form instead of um, the sort of simplified form is because I'm gonna, this is the best form um, for taking the, the, the derivative again, which I'm going to do in a second. Um, 
bring the negative one third down. Decrease the exponent by one. Same thing here. Uh, five. That's ten ninths. <clears throat> now let's. Uh, it's best if, since we're using a second derivative to assess concavity, it's a good idea to uh, clean it up. Move in that direction, let's get rid of the negative exponents. So, all I did here is just write x to the negative 4 thirds is 1 over x to the 4 thirds. Same thing here. Now I want to get a common denominator, which would be what? 9x to the 4 thirds. Mainly because this exponent, I mean they look the same, but this exponent is bigger than this one. So if the common denominator is going to be, and it is, 9 uh, x to the 4 thirds. What do I have to multiply this by? X. It, yes. In order to get 9 to the x thirds, the answer is x. That's right. And now we have our common denominator. to the one third times x better be x to the four thirds than it is. And mm, I don't know. You could leave it like this. You could factor out. Let's factor out And remember, when you're raising uh, a number to the, mm. oh, sorry, I'm waiting for my nap. Um, when you raise something to the four thirds power, you're doing two things. You're taking the cube root, and you're also raising it to the fourth power. Just saying. So, when is f double prime of x. There are two things I want to know. When, when is the second derivative 0? When is the second derivative undefined? Well, it's 0 when the top is 0, right? Actually, I don't have to worry about the um, I only have to worry about the 5x plus 8 equaling 0. And when I set 5x plus 8 equal to 0, I get negative 8 fifths. When is f double prime undefined? If 9, don't answer this out loud. I want to give everybody a chance to think about this. If 9 times x to the 4 thirds is 0, then what has to be true about x? Don't answer yet. What do you think? 
Karen, what do you think? What's your best guess? If 9x to the 4 thirds is 0, then x would have to be what? I mean, if you want to be, if you want to, you can, you can always, um, just go through the motions, get rid of the 9 by dividing with sites by 9. And how do you solve x to the 4 thirds equals 0? Well, I would just say take raise both sides to the fourth third, uh, three fourths power. Because four thirds times three fourths is one. What's zero to the what's zero to any power other than zero? It's zero. You don't have to actually take it through all of these steps. But some people like to do it whatever. Your call. Okay. Um, let's try and finish this. Where's that ruler? is what, negative one and three fifths. to the left of negative 8 this. And you plug that into the second derivative. Are you going to get a positive? And that's all we care about. I don't care what the, what, if it's negative, I don't care what comes after the minus sign. It's, it's not important. I just want to know, is the answer positive or negative? So think about it. If you put in a negative 8 fifths here, no, sorry, we're going to the left. So pick something to the left of negative 8 fifths. Like negative 2. Negative 2 would be good. Plug it in here, multiply by this, divide by this. And remember, all we care about are the signs. So it's like, so think, you know, like plus, minus, plus, or whatever. Okay, so let's go through that. Is this positive or negative? If you pick a number to the left of negative 8 fifths. It's negative, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And this is negative. Negative, negative times, times negative. negative. What about the bottom? Well, the reason why I know the bottom is negative is because when I see this 9 uh, x to the 4 thirds, immediately I see that, oh, we're raising something to the 4th power. It's an even power. So if x is negative, when I raise it to the 4th power, it's going to be positive. <coughs> so, Negative times negative, positive divided by positive is big old plus. Okay, so what if we choose something between negative 8 fifths and 0? Like negative 1. Is this positive, this factor, is positive or negative? Positive, positive negative, positive. That's going to be negative, isn't it? Then you pick something to the right of 0, like 1. Positive, positive, negative, 
Isn't that also going to be negative? Okay, so the only, um, oh, I said discuss concavity. Okay, fine. Um, F is concave up on the interval from minus infinity to minus eight fifths. on the safe side you might want to separate the two intervals because remember we know that when it, when x is 0 the second derivative is undefined and that that should make you a little bit nervous because we don't I mean we're going to look at it a little bit more closely and figure out sort of why it's undefined, what, what, what it means. Um, but you want to be careful about trying to fuse these two uh, intervals into one. Because sometimes when, sometimes when you do it, there's no problem. But sometimes when you do it, see, if you, if you combine these together, then you're saying that the, the, the function is concave down on the entire interval from um, minus eight fifths to infinity. And that may not be true. I mean, it, for example, if the graph is sharp at the point corresponding to x equals zero, then, uh, then that's problematic. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But I want to do the last bit. So f is concave up on this interval, concave down on these two intervals. And does it have any inflection points? Just one. Yeah, the only possible inflection point is, well, it's this. F of negative eight fifths approximately. Go back to the original function. It's, it's yucky. Plug it into to this, see what you get. question and then when we come back from our break I'm going to show you the graph of this function I'm punching in. Um, okay, 
Okay, in order to be an inflection point, listen very carefully, to be an inflection point, the concavity has to change. If there is no change in concavity at the point in question, then it's not a, an inflection point. Just because the second derivative is zero at the number five, let's say, doesn't mean that the point five comma half five is an inflection point. Because concavity doesn't have to change necessarily at a place where the second derivative is zero. There is a change in concavity. It goes concave up, concave down, concave down. There is a change in concavity at negative 8 fifths. So that's good. This will be an inflection point if there's one other condition. What has to be true about the graph of that? It has to be smooth. Now, here's how to figure out whether it's smooth or not. If, certainly if the derivative of f, the first derivative, at negative 8 fifths, if it's defined, if it's a number, if I take f prime of negative 8 fifths and I get a number, then remember that tells me, uh, among other things, that f is differentiable at negative 8 fifths. And if f is differentiable at a number, then the graph is smooth at that point. Remember, differentiability definitely means uh, that the graph is smooth. So. If I were, and I'm not asking you to, um, to actually plug this in and give me an exact value, but if you were to go back to f prime, and you were to plug in negative 8 fifths here and here, obviously it's not going to be a pretty number, it's a number, but will I get a number out of that? Or will something happen that will make it undefined? Is negative eight fifths to the to the negative one thirds? Is that a number? Remember, it's cube root, not square root. Can I take the cube cube root of a of a negative number and get a real number? Absolutely. Even if the number's ugly. So this will end up being a number when I simplify it. And then I plug in negative 8 fifths here. That'll be another ugly number. You take uh, two ugly numbers, subtract one from the other, usually the result is also ugly. Although sometimes the, there'll be a cancellation of sorts and you get something like four. It's like every now and then two ugly people produce a really pretty baby. But it doesn't usually happen that way. Okay, so when we come back, I'm going to sketch the graph of this for you, but because um, I want you to see it, and in particular, I want you to see this inflection point because it's really subtle, and then we'll talk about second derivative tests. F prime at negative eight fifths is negative six point eight. The important thing is it's defined. 